To do so is to be parasitic, so to speak. And a progressive university has no place for parasites. Everyone must carry his or her own weight in the continuing challenge to be centers of excellence. This sliding may be part May, this sliding on the part of some may be a, manifest, a manifestation of eroding values. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of seriousness of purpose for those who have taken upon themselves the education of the youth. For example, it is important that in every word and deed that we do, that we do not bluff or dissimulate. We fail in our mission if we allow, much less teach, our students to be spin machines when confronted with a question or puzzle for which they do not know the real answer. Recruitment constraints. Seek superior intellects wherever. When discussing the issues of faculty and staff, what cannot avoid touching upon the issue of recruitment? It is no great secret that there is an accepted bias of recruiting from among our alumni. We become too complacent in the search for future faculty and researchers when we allow our alumni into our ranks without having them pass through a fine sieve. We do not look hard enough, far enough, long enough in many situations, and we think we are in our proper comfort zone when we hire an alumnus. Many alumni turn out to be duds. I know so because in my years of having been director of the MSI, I have had to let go quite a few who turned out to be unsuitable to be given tenure. Administrators have, must have the willpower to let go doubtful or marginal assets because once they are given tenure, the university may be saddled by mediocrity for several decades, which is a long, long time. We need to raise the bar both in our recruitment and in our tenure policies. It is incumbent on our administrators to do this even if they become unpopular. Here is a statement for which I might be booed off the stage. This university is replete with intelligent personnel, but there are not enough intellectuals. The university needs to increase their number in its second century, if it is to keep from sliding down the ranks of tertiary in educational institutions in Asia and in the world. Let us not forget that when we were recruiting, <coughs> that, that when we are recruiting, we must not only use this country as our yardstick. It is not sufficient to be number one in the Philippines. We must be number one in the region, or at least at a much higher level than we have been in the past decades when compared to other universities. Other leaders have stated this, and I have said it in public fora in the past. This university must not be populist, whether we are speaking of students or of the faculty. It must be elitist in its recruitment of superior intellects, whether rich or poor. We need a proactive search process to seek out the best above the rest. If Harvard students need a minimum 120 IQ points to be admitted, can we not expect that all of our new faculty have this level of intelligence, if not our students? Love of country. Develop and enhance patriotism give this more than lip service. This may be an appropriate place to bring in a brief story. A friend of mine from the National University of Singapore forwarded to me a recent essay by a Korean student who is studying English in this country. Not surprisingly, the visitor dealt with a topic of what is wrong with Filipinos, since he has been witness to the problems and blazon in the front pages of our dailies. Making comparisons between how Korea suffered between, through two wars and was reduced to poverty, but subsequently rose up, and the Philippines, which was way ahead of them after the Second World War, but is now where it is, he suggests that the difference 
was in the patriotism of the people. He makes the observation that the average Filipino does not love his country. He cites examples of people working for themselves instead of working for their neighborhood, quotation marks. He notes the penchant of many to leave their country instead of trying to help it. Are we patriotic, and do we try to instill patriotism in our students? I think each one of us can answer this for himself. We obviously should be, and I think, and I like to think that we have the duty to do and say what we can to foster love of country. I could write and deliver a separate speech about this, but I, just, I want to just raise one issue. To what extent should we encourage our students to work abroad? And if we do encourage them, do we qualify this with the exhortation that they should come back soon. As Chancellor Cao stated in his address to the graduating students in 2006, this tax-supported public university is not meant to train students to serve other countries. I seem to have a difference of opinion with some of my colleagues who take the view that it is not really necessary to encourage them to come back as society is becoming more global. I am not a great fan of Filipinos who spend the best years of their working lives abroad and only come back when they have retired or are close to retirement. I do wonder if they do this because their conscience bothers them or they have nothing better to do at that stage. I should like to caution our leaders to be circumspect in whom they, the university honors in this respect lest we give the wrong message to our young graduates. As I read in an editorial in the Philippine Star a few months ago, quote, no country ever became great because its citizens left it, much less its talented citizens. Fragmentation, <clears throat> attitude change. Think of the rest of the next higher level of organization. While in the process of actually writing my lecture, I happened to come across the March 18 column of William Esposo in the Philippine Star that made reference to the problem of fragmentation in this country. He started his column with a narration of the recent celebrated hubbub surrounding a beauty contest where one of the winning candidates could not speak English well. I need not dwell on that issue but refer to the main part of the article where the journalist quotes a foreigner, James Fallows, who wrote some two decades ago of our fragmented society when commenting on the lack of nationalism. He noted that tribal fragmentation contributed to a feeble nationalism and a contempt for the public good. Today, I continue to see the tolerance nay, the comfortable accommodation that is often made of fragmentation within the university. Let me start with an innocuous example from my own institute. When we built our headquarters, I provided for a faculty lounge and a, co a common refectory or cafeteria for the general staff with the end in view that there will be a common place where senior staff can congregate regularly and exchange information informally and a similar place for the junior staff together with the administrative staff. Today, the faculty lounge has one regular customer, and the larger refectory is only used by a minority of the staff. One of the reasons for this is that some Magaling na faculty have decided to set up their own coffee corners where, where they and their immediate staff, often only half a dozen or so individuals, have their meals and snacks. Whatever their intentions, we see fragmentation of an already small institute and lose the opportunity to share information and avoid problems that arise from ignorance. Switching to the campus, I see the absurdity of this tendency to fragment in the development and continued permission of frat for fraternities to exist and continue killing students. Is not one life lost enough of a message to society.
coming from a private school where I had my undergraduate education. I see a great contrast with the UP in terms of how community identity is demonstrated. One manifestation is the support for sports events. Last year, the UP Maroons had the distinction of not having won one basketball game in the UAAP. Was this only because our players were outclassed or due to the lack of economic incentives for them? Was this not as much, if not more so, because there has been little enthusiastic support and cheering for our athletic teams by the students and the faculty. In the several decades that I have been in with the UP, I have never seen anything that approximates what I call the recticano spirit of students, faculty, and alumni of the De La Salle University when they face their rivals, especially when it is the Ateneo. There is a sense of identity which finds enthusiastic expression when facing a challenge. While I do not deny that there is a UP spirit, it needs to be expressed better and more openly. Faith and belief need to be reinforced sensually and more than occasionally. Is it only after 100 years that the UP is taking some pride and overt action to manifest its esprit de corps? as a leading academic institution. Why can't we do it every year? The rule of man, <coughs> attitude change, always follow the rule of law. Early in the incumbency of uh, President Jose Abueva, he addressed the university conference on governance where I had, to, I had the occasion to raise the question, should we be following the rule of law or the rule of man in the execution of our duties as heads of units. His reply, of course, was an affirmation of what I had learned much earlier, the rule of law. Still today, one encounters situations where officials prefer to dispense privilege as they interpret the situation at hand and rather than adhering to objective norms. I recall many years ago, I was in conversation with the incumbent chancellor then about some official business when I happened to mention I, in passing that I might not qualify for a professorial chair that year. What was my surprise when he said something like, if you need a professorial chair, just let me know. Of course I needed a professorial chair to augment my modest salary. But it surprised me that a university official was being cavalier about offering up me a professorial chair for I believed that these were earned, not asked for. Fortunately, when the final tally of the of, uh, <coughs> earned points was completed in the college, my total was sufficiently high to earn me a chair. It would have been against my religion to have accepted a chair that I did not deserve, nor did I want to be in a position where I had an utang na loob. This university must be a meritocracy and not a padrino system. Let me continue to dwell on this a little bit more. 